okay, what's spirituality? In my view, it's something innate to us. And I would describe it as our deepest values, our deepest sense of essence, Mm. the knowledge we have in us, and this is a, a strong place, of what doesn't change. Do we know that in our own experience? And I think that human beings long to know that. We all long to know, is there something that won't change when I die? Anything? Can I touch it now while I'm still alive? Can I know it? Oh my God, if I could, that would change everything for me. And it does actually change everything. What does it take to put your life's work out there in a really big way? How much can I do with this one precious life? Welcome to The Selfish Gift. My guest today is one of the leading lights of the spirituality and human potential movement, as well as a multimedia trailblazer. Tammy Simon is the founder at Sounds True, which is one of the preeminent publishing houses in the new thought spirituality world. Tammy's also one of the few publishers or business leaders in the publishing space to have kind of come out from behind the scenes to become a public figure and thought leader in her own right. So she's a bit of a role model for me. She's also the host of the very popular podcast, Insights at the Edge, which has now, I think, about 750 episodes and counting in conversation with spiritual leaders and visionaries. It's been downloaded, I think, at last count, more than 15 million times. Tammy has also curated and edited several multi-author books, including The Self-Acceptance Project, with contributions from some of the world's most revered spiritual leaders. Tammy, thank you so much for joining me here today. It's such a pleasure to have you. It's great to be with you, Maggie. Wonderful. Amazing. So you started Sounds True at the tender age of 22. Um, and as legend has it, a woman with a tape recorder and a mission to spread spiritual wisdom in the world. And 35 years later, you've grown it into really one of the most beloved brands um, in the spirituality and healing space. And we're going to get into some of the you know many new permutations it has taken in a minute. But first, I just really want to ask you, what was it that sparked this fascination with spirituality and personal growth? Was there a a specific book or a teacher that really lit you up as a young person? Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of it is the light that landed on me came into someone who was, as a teenager, lonely, anxious, and experiencing myself as somewhat of an outlier from uh, my family and from the status quo. And so I was looking. I was looking. I was looking for a way to belong really inside myself to start and in the world. So that was the ground. And then, you know, early on, I read some books. I read a book by Herman Hess called Mm -hmm. Demian. And I, uh, as a young person, I was fortunate to read some books by Alan Watts. And reading those books, uh, there was something about it where I, I remember the feeling inside more than anything else. And the feeling inside was of, uh, I could describe it as homecoming, Mm -hmm. of relaxing, of exhaling, of knowing like, oh my God, everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Look, these people lived and they wrote from this space and they threw me a lifeline and I'm catching that lifeline right now. And I'm going to hold on to it. And I'm going to, you know, put this book under my pillow and I'm going to almost like I wanted to lick the pages. I mean, it was that like palpable and real for me, this communion that I had uh, with uh, people who were no longer alive, but with their words and with the, you could say the transmission power, because that's really uh, now, as you mentioned, sounds true as a media company. That's what I hope we can give to people through capturing wisdom teachings that still have intact this transmission power. And that transmission was of endless possibility, Mm -hmm. pure potential. Uh, You use the word light, and I like that word, pure light, a sense that we can connect to that. that That's actually our nature. Mm -hmm. And so that was sort of, that's been my kind of guiding 
North Star is to offer that to others. Beautiful. I want to um, refer to uh, a very recent um, episode of your podcast, a solo episode in which you talked about um, the term spiritual entrepreneur and how when uh, someone first applied it to you a little while ago, it sort of sat with you in an odd way at first and then you you came around to embrace it. Um, I can relate to that term spiritual entrepreneur myself and also to, you know, some of those complex feelings um, in our culture. Uh, we are, you know, kind of often led to see this some this, this perceived conflict between for-profit ventures, you know, kind of like the tools of capitalism and spirituality, which is meant to be unconcerned with material things. I think the word that you used was that it struck you as a little oily. Um, so I'm curious uh, to hear how do you define spiritual entrepreneurship now? Yeah. Well, I think the first thing that helped me, and I'm going to answer that question in a moment, but the first thing that helped me not feel like it was oily was to realize I'm not oily. Yeah. I'm not oily. And, you know, whatever anybody might say or think, that's their business and they can, you know, think or say and project whatever they want. But I think when you really know yourself on the inside, that's the most powerful thing. And if you know, what's your actual motivation? Like, are you clear? Is anybody, are you clear on what your motivation is? And so for me, my motivation, and it's been this way really since I was a young person, and I don't know if I even fully understand it, but the place where I always go is, can I be of service? Can I be of service? How? Things are so horrible for so many people. There's so much suffering and we're all in touch with it. And I think there's something that rises in the human heart when you care that says, I'd like to help. I want to help. How can I help? How can I help this? Is there some way I can help? And so that's the core to me in many ways of something that we could call a spiritual impulse, an impulse to be of service in a practical way. And to me, entrepreneurship is incredibly practical. It's practical because it says, I have a dollar. How can I use that dollar to make another dollar mm -hmm. so that I can then make, and really I need to make a dollar and one cent so that I can pay back that dollar and I can take that one cent and do something else and do something else and do something else. And I can create this self-funding growing uh, organization, organism that does more good and more good and more good and supports the people who work in it as well as their customers, the customers. So to me, that's kind of the core of spiritual entrepreneurship is knowing your true motivation and then taking capital to do good in a way that lifts everyone up in the process. Yeah. I, somebody said to me recently, we were talking about money and money as a form of energy. And, and we were talking in this conversation about care and the types of care that we extend to each other. And um, she shared with me the notion that money is, can be a form of care. You know, when you when you create a source of supply for your for your employees, um, you know, when you are putting out products that enrich people's lives, um, that this doesn't have to be in conflict with your beautiful um, human values and your desire to to be of service. It can be absolutely part of it. But Tammy, where do you think this dichotomy between spiritual principles and material success or commercial activity, where does it come from and what does it cost us as a society to, to remain yeah. stuck in that mindset? Well, I think one thing is we really have to, first of all, separate spirituality from religion. And it's like, okay, yeah, 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 we know that. We know that. But do we know that? Really? And I say that because as soon as you hear that word, I think people still associate it with the traditional religions that many of us were introduced to and that run through our family lines. And in the religious world, I think there's been just so much, uh, I guess I'll just say it the way I see it, terribleness mm -hmm. that has made a lot of us critical for every good reason. Mm -hmm. 
of religions. And then we also take that criticism and we apply it to spirituality. And so for a moment, I'd like to separate that because I think a lot of the views about money and quote unquote religion come from the religious world. Mm -hmm. If we just separate that and we go, okay, what's spirituality? In my view, it's something innate to us. And I would describe it as our deepest values, our deepest sense of essence, Mm -hmm. the knowledge we have in us, and this is a, a strong place, of what doesn't change. Do we know that in our own experience? And I think that human beings long to know that. We all long to know, is there something that won't change when I die? Anything? Can I touch it now while I'm still alive? Can I know it? Oh my God, if I could, that would change everything for me. And it does actually change everything. Now, this is so valuable that we want to give it away. And we do. I want to give it away. I want to give it away in every interaction I have, every moment. I don't want to charge for it, but guess what? I have to pay my bills and I hire really good people, camera operators, editors, uh, accountants, and now lawyers and all kinds of people. And they need to be paid. So I need to charge people. Okay. Okay. This is not fair to take an accusation against churches, historical churches, or uh, you know, other ways that uh, money was uh, distorted and used for uh, private gain. Let's look at it differently. I think we have to open our minds. And, you know, I love this is a phrase um, sometimes that's used in businesses, you know, starting from first principles. Or I like to say just starting with a blank sheet of paper, because I still like paper, like actual paper and a pen. And it's like, get out a blank sheet of paper. Don't carry forward this view of money and religion and all. No, no, start with a blank sheet of paper and say, okay, how do we bring this thing that has so much value to as many people as possible? And what economic instruments might we use as part of that? Because the people who are working on it are going to need to get paid. Mm-hmm. Well, meanwhile, um, you know, capitalism has also done all absent of religion, all sure. kinds of harm around the world, you know, um, placing profits above people and above the environment. And I think that, um, you know, we, we need new leaders to show how uh, the imperatives of, um, you know, profitability and a thriving organization don't have to come at the cost of those underlying values that you talked about. But, and it sounds true. We have a foundation. So we have a nonprofit arm as well as our for-profit arm. And I think a lot of the for-profit businesses that I deeply respect have found ways to tie these two things together mm-hmm. and to figure out, okay, who are the people who can pay for what we have so that that will support us being able to do other things where there aren't funds that could come in. So our nonprofit arm reaches incarcerated people with spiritual teachings and mm. uh, provides care for caregivers in places uh, where that are, are trauma stricken. So there's all kinds of ways, as, as you say, even within this capitalist structure, we can think afresh about how do we lift all of the stakeholders. So it's not a company that's on the backs of the many for the benefit of the few, but instead an actual design, design into it, the pro bono efforts, design into it. How much are you going to give away for free and how, and how can you afford to do that? How can you involve your customers in that? Get really creative. Start with a blank sheet of paper and an open mind. Right. And you wouldn't even be able to put that generosity into action if you weren't, if you didn't have surplus beyond yeah. your, your basic, you know, survival needs. Um, so aside from business as uh, an altruistic engine, which I absolutely, you know, hear you describing was, has been baked into it since the start. Um, do you think that business can also be a path of spiritual growth for its uh, creator for its founder? And, and if so, how has it been that for you? 
Sure. Well, first of all, I think if you're on a genuine path of growth and development, everything, everything, everything you do, everything is your path and everything's challenging and grist for the mill. I mean, it's not always challenging, but life will provide you with a challenge. Mm -hmm. I think we find this right all the time. And how, you know, it's just, uh, hosting a, a conversation yesterday evening with Eckhart Tolle, and it was on becoming a teacher of presence. And in it, he was talking about how you can um, understand the stages of awakening in people, because someone asked a question about that. Is there such a thing? And he said, uh, interesting to look at how do people respond when they're challenged? That's where it gets interesting. Mm. And how do people respond when they have power? Like if you want to see their egos kick up, if we want to see our own egos kick up, and by by that, I mean, if you want to see the part of you that uh, wants to complain about life and fight against life and wants to be entitled about things going my way, and et cetera, and wants this suddenly to be all about me, we'll put a, cha- put a really hard challenge. And of course, business is incredibly challenging. <laughs> As you know, it's just it's it's designed that way, it seems, because it involves lots of people and uh, lots of people's uh, needs uh, and differing needs, just like it's really hard to get along with one other person in an intimate relationship, any kind of relationship. Now you got bunches of people right. communicating, seeing things differently from different points of view trying to find alignment. So it's it's just it's designed for growth. Now you could say is this spiritual growth, is this personal growth? I don't separate those things. Because you know, one of the things I found and you know I'm not trying to go too off off tangent here is I found like spiritual teachers who weren't that great at managing their interpersonal relationships. And I found that really um uh, I, I was critical of that just to p- say it plainly. And I yeah. was like, come on, what good is yeah. your ability to expand into infinite light if you can't handle somebody who disagrees with your opinions and sees things differently and wants to do things differently? So, I mean, to me, really, uh, the litmus test always is how are we interacting with mm-hmm. each other? How much are we learning from each other? How much are we hearing each other? And all of that is growth and business gives you opportunity upon opportunity. Yeah, it sure does. And especially as the stakes seem to get higher, as the business gains in its sort of own critical mass. And, you know, you you mentioned um, entitlement and and ego and power and all of those things, you know, are really things that can be fueled by the rise and growth of a business uh, for everyone involved in it. People wanting a piece of the action in a specific way. Um but I, I love the idea that it's actually not distinct from any other path we might choose through life, that if we're on a spiritual path, however it looks is how it looks for us. So yeah. Let's go back to how it looks for you. I'd love to take a, a, a little section where we talk about your journey um, with Sounds True. And I want to go back all the way to 19... 19- 85, uh, sure. the year that you started the company, um, which I just can't get over the fact that you were 22, like what crazy chutzpah. Um, it's now a multimedia empire, really, and so much more than a book publisher. Um, many different kinds of products and experiences uh, that you've created, but it all started with audio content. Why is that? Yeah. Well, so I went for two years to Swarthmore College. And while I was at Swarthmore, one of the things I discovered was that I liked listening to the lectures that teachers gave more than I liked the long reading assignments. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. What is it that I like about listening so much? And I I never really knew, but I just fell in love with it. And I fell in love with radio as well. Mm. And so at Swarthmore, I was able to have the key to the radio station And from midnight to 6 a.m., the graveyard shift where nobody was on air, they said, you can go on air as much as you want between midnight and 6 a.m. So that's what I did. And I just fell in love with uh, spinning 
uh, you know, LPs, the microphone, the environment, the ability that I could be alone and reach out and help people like that just fit my personality so well, because I noticed when I was actually physically present with people, I could get awkward um, and strange (laughs) anyway. (laughs) But when I was alone, I was at my best. And yet I was also connecting to people. So I had this deep love of spoken word art and the spoken word forms, including uh, including interviewing. And anyway, so that was really in the beginning when I started Sounds True. It happened because I inherited a small amount of money when my father died. Mm-hmm. So I inherited $50,000. And I mean, it, it's kind of a long story, but I went through an analysis at a certain point of, did I want to use that money to disseminate spiritual wisdom? Disseminate spiritual wisdom was the operating instructions that I felt the universe had given me Mm. so that I could throw out those lifelines, as I mentioned to others, the way they had been uh, tossed to me by these uh, great teachers from history. And then I went through a process of like, what form should I use? And I already had a volunteer radio show and I already had a little dubbing deck at home. And on my little one-to-one dubbing deck, I would make five, six copies a week of my show because people would call in and request it. And I would charge them $10 a cassette copy for my little show. (laughs) And so, uh, and I'd also seen these high speed uh, tape, duplication machines. So you could put in one uh, master cassette and you could make seven, eight, nine, ten 10 copies in three minutes. Mm. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm already going to these lectures and workshops that I can't really afford to go to. I wish I could afford to go to them. Now I'll go and I'll ask the author, can we record what you're doing? I'll make high-speed copies for the people that are there. I'll give you a submaster of the master I created, and I'll give you a share of the proceeds. And so this was my little, you know, innovative way to go to the workshops I wanted to go to, to sit in the back of the room with headphones on so I was separate from everybody, which I also really appreciated because I wanted to learn, but I didn't want to do all the interactive exercises because they made me nervous uh-huh. with like, people in the room and stuff. So I like, oh, I'm in the back. I'm listening. I'm learning. I'm growing. This is so fabulous. And I'm leaving with a wad of cash. I love and, it. And, <laughs> you know, and so I was like, and the author, of course, the presenter, the teacher was thrilled. Here's a professionally recorded copy of what you just did that you can do whatever you want with. So it was it was a great little way to get started. Tammy, I, I've never heard that story before, and I can't believe it. I love it. What I love about that is that um, it it's just all so organic. You were following not only your, as you, I think you said, you know, your your instructions that you received, yeah, uh, but also just leaning into your preferences. Like this feels good. I I don't want to be face to face with a bunch of bodies. Um, I want to be free in the way. And here's what a, a, a setting and a situation that makes me feel free. Um, and then you just went for it. Um, so that's, 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 that's really remarkable. And the fact that like in hindsight, it looks like an amazingly prescient business move to sort of like, oh, you know, scoop up audiobook rights before audiobooks even existed, you know, um, but it actually came from a far more um, personal and um, completely, I wasn't really led place. I wasn't even really paying attention to the audiobook movement. To me, audiobooks felt like, uh, yes, it was education or entertainment, but it was like reading something in a written. I was interested in something else. Mm-hmm. I was interested in transmission-based learning, as mm-hmm. I referred to, mm-hmm. that comes through when someone is speaking in the moment from their experience, from their heart. And it was modeled more on Dharma talks Mm-hmm. And having been present early on and having gone to a lot of meditation retreats. And when I went to these meditation retreats, I would sit back and I would listen to the talk that the Dharma teacher would give. And for me, it was like music, honestly. I loved it so much, a great teacher talking like that. And of course, they had their notes and things, but they weren't like reading a yeah. script. They were speaking from the space of yeah. that moment and sitting there on the cushion. Uh, was such a joy for me, especially when they had beautiful voices, when they were uh, pointing to things 
with a certain kind of cadence where I could feel into what they were pointing to. And yeah, so that was modeled more on that. And I was sort of oblivious to the audiobook phenomenon. That, I, oh, I love that. I love how, you know, strat- we can have almost like accidental brilliant strategies just by tuning into our, you know, our heart's desire. That's just so amazing. And so, so you must have been sitting there in these, uh, in these lectures and just thinking like, how could I make it so that everybody in the world can be in this room? I'm going to take this 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 actual raw recording of this human voice speaking and 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 share it with the world. Well, I think that you said it well when you said accidental uh, and organic because it really all did occur quite like that, and it also came on a bed of uh, desperation, struggle, and I will say prayer too. Mm, great, because yeah, powerful forces, it, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, when I dropped out of college, this was quite a disappointment to my family. Mm. And quite honestly, I didn't understand what was going on with me. I really didn't. I didn't know why I couldn't finish college. Uh, I thought, come on, just do it, Tammy. Just get well, the degree. You know, it means so much. to be a total fl- failure. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, at the time, of course, I didn't realize that. And, you know, my family was like, this is what gives you a ticket. And I was like, well, I don't know if it's a ticket where I want to go. This is what gives you a seat at the table and, you know, all that. But I didn't, they were like, so what are you going to do? And I was like, well, that's a really good question. I don't know. Maybe I'll be a drummer in an all girls band. And, you know, except that I, you know, never had picked up drumsticks before. It was just an image. Like, I didn't know. I really didn't know. Deeply wow. didn't know. But I also knew that I couldn't. Th- continue in something that felt like it was, it didn't fit. It felt like it wasn't the right set of clothes for me. The, the, the clothes just didn't fit me, you know, whether I, I couldn't breathe in the torso or it was like whatever image you want to give, too small a bikini. It was like, these clothes don't fit. And I think that's one of the interesting sensitivities I've had in my life is I know when something doesn't fit. And the unfortunate thing, and it's difficult is when, but I think this is the nature of it. You don't know where you're going. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if only I like knew, I didn't know. I just knew I had to say no. So through a a, working with a a rebirthing practitioner in Boulder, Colorado, we came up with this prayer, which was my true prayer, which was God, I'm willing to do your work. Please show me what it is. And I was like, you know, I don't care if I have to mop floors. I just want to do quote unquote God's work. And that meant something to me. It was like, I didn't even know. It was just some sense of uh, ministry that I wanted to offer, even though I didn't really know what it was. It was just, I want to do God's work. Show me what it is. And the word willing was really important because it wasn't like I was willful, like I'm going to push my agenda onto the world no matter what. But I also didn't want to be willless, like I'm just lying here like a blob. Like I'm willing to work hard. You know, I remember uh, when I started Sounds True, uh, finally, my mother said to me, God, you were like a, a tiger roaming the streets. Thank goodness there's so- finally something, you know, for you to sink your teeth into and to do. And so I had this, like, I'm willing, I want to know. And that's, I think, through that. And I had to, I had to say that prayer for months. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and then through that, uh, I had a conversation with somebody that I was interviewing for my volunteer radio show where I wanted to keep learning, interviewing spiritual teachers, because even though I left academia, I didn't want the academic approach to spiritual realization, but I did want to keep learning. So that's the, the reason I hosted this volunteer show. And so anyway, one of the people I was interviewing, uh, it was soon after I had inherited uh, the money and he had, of all things, uh, a, a yin-yang symbol with a dollar sign through the center of it and the words transformational economy on his window. Even though I was interviewing him about a different topic, he also had crystals in his window. Okay, we're back. It's 1985. Okay, yeah. anyway, I said to him, I've inherited this money. Do you have any thoughts what I should do with it? I don't know what to do with it. I don't want to just put it in the bank and just let it sit there. And he said, why don't you put it in yourself? And I said, because I don't know what me and myself are going to do with it. Like, what are Mm -hmm. we going to do? I don't know. And he looked at me and he said, Tammy, you know what you want to do. Come back in three days and we'll talk about it. Wow. And I was like, okay. And then, you know, I walked out of his office 
And then I had a very odd experience. And that odd experience was I felt like I was walking above the ground, like three feet above the ground. So first of all, I was just like, this is really odd. What's happening? Why am I walking above the ground? I had no idea. And then I heard a voice. And of course, to this day, I don't know, was it an internal voice or what was it? And it said, disseminate spiritual wisdom, period. And when the period was there, uh, I hit the ground. My feet were back on the ground. And I knew that's what I was going to do. And then I went through this process of figuring out how and deciding that I would start with audio. And so I'm sharing that story because, you know, I think sometimes we think it's just up to us and we're caught in a kind of um, human centric, rational way of approaching our life. And, you know, look, I'm a thinking type. I think a lot. And so it's not like I'm like, oh, I'm just, you know living in the cloud bank with angels and spirit beings and, you know, fully immersed in that universe all the time. I'm not. However, I have had enough experiences in my life here talking to you at 61 to know that through sincerity and openness, real sincerity and real openness, other forces and, uh, real uh, uh, forces of benevolence have intervened in my life at important junctures and important times and have said very clearly, go this way, Mm. do this at really important times. And there you go. It's not just up to us. It's not like just some, uh, you know, solo rational individual thing. It's not like that. Even the gentleman that I was with and the the conversation we were having and the fact that he looked at me and said it, you know what you want to do. His force of benevolence, his life force at that moment catalyzed something. That was part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, our connection together, that was part of it. Uh, The openness I had to hear, to say, oh, I'm walking above the ground. What's going on? I was open. And then the bravery to follow through. Totally. All all of it's it's part of the package. And we do know what we want. We do know what we want, but our culture tells us so much to, you know, to, to ignore those signals and to do what is sensible. And I think especially today, there just seems to be so much um, emphasis placed on, uh, you know, having your your, your plan or knowing what your big vision for your life is. And and what you're telling me is that, you know, you, 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 you had a next step clarity, but you didn't have a long-term clarity. You know, you were, it took a lot of courage to step out into the, the fog of the unknown. Like, I don't know where this is going, but I know I'm supposed to do it right now. And I know that it's connected to my, um, my, my mission. Yeah. To disseminate spirit and- system. I just want to say, you know, we're talking now about something that happened when I was 22. And this requirement to leap into the unknown, to let go of the safe territory of our life, and when asked to move forward, to go forward into the unknown, this is still happening Mm -hmm. again and again in my life. It doesn't end. And it does require a uh, release of uh, kind of like our known reference points to say, you know, I'm going to go on a big adventure. I'm going to try this thing. And it doesn't stop being scary. (laughs) It doesn't stop being scary. It doesn't. But, you know, I do think that we, I'll speak for myself, I have a lot more support now in my life than I did when I was young. I think when I was that age, I didn't know how to have a whole like support team that were like, we're going to all do this together, Tammy. You're not just by yourself. We're all, we've got you. We got you. We got each other, you know, and that makes a big difference. So I think I learned that over the years, but there's still, uh, you know, um, well, as I'm sitting here talking to you, I can feel my support team, but it's me in this mouth. So you're still on your own in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, 
and it, and and it continues to you know life requires courage of us to to continue expanding um would you be willing to share with me an instance of uh you know a time when when you're either your courage or your vision were tested by practical um, imperatives or constraints um, and how you navigated through that moment? Well, I think it's happening right now. Uh, so, I mean, it's, it's happening right now. Uh, you know, I always thought my life would change a lot when I hit what's known in astrology as your second Saturn return. So, you know, your first Saturn return. And I'm not like big into astrology or anything, but uh, I do think many people will identify between the age of 58 and 62. There's a kind of change of life that happens just like at the end of your 20s during mm. your first Saturn return. I always thought my life would change, but little did I know how much. There I was living in Boulder, Colorado, while my wife, who's Canadian, and I had always planned for the last 20 years to build a summer home up on an island north of Vancouver, Cortez Island, where I am right now. We had always planned that, but little did I know that I would end up moving to Canada, <laughs> uh, which I now have. And we sold our home in Boulder and uh, bought a home in Vancouver. And, uh, you know, I think the bravery of leaving the embedded community that I had in Boulder and coming to a new place and making a whole new set of friends and finding a new dentist, et cetera. And then on top of it, I did not expect to pass the CEO baton, mm -hmm. which I did uh, earlier this year. Yeah, to someone who's yeah. worked with me for seven years. But part of it and is that I saw, I mean, you said, you know, Tammy not only started this multimedia company, but she came out front. She came out front. Not only, and, you know, quite honestly, I was a lot more comfortable when I was behind the scenes. I've already described to you. I like being in the corner with headphones. I didn't want to come in front of the curtain. For the longest time, I was like, let's let the authors, they'll take the bullets, you know, because you become a target as soon as you yeah. become public. But I did know, oh, the situation is starting to feel too small. Yeah. Starting to feel too small. Something feels small. Yeah. I don't feel like I'm quite in the right space where, you know, and, and this is one of the interesting things, and this is becoming quite a long answer to your question, Maggie. No, you're actually answering all kinds like, of questions that I've got lined up. So Okay. So it's okay. But it's like, you know, this is something I learned from one of the teachers who's in our inner MBA program. Uh, she teaches at Harvard. Her name is Lisa Leahy, and she's a developmental psychologist. And she talks about what is the growth zone for people. And we don't grow if we're not challenged. And we also can't have so much challenge that it's like, oh my God, I'm stretched so thin, I'm breaking, I'm paralyzed. So we need a certain amount of support to help us with the challenge, and we need a certain amount of challenge. So when both those things line up, you're in the growth zone. And I think as a person, I've felt that always like, oh, you know, I need more support to handle this thing because I took on something really huge or I need to, t I need to stretch. Mm. I need to do something that's going to be, that's going to put me out there a little bit. I'm getting too comfortable. There's not enough stretch in this system. So it's like finding that growth zone and adjusting all the time. So I saw, uh, at sounds true that, uh, I needed to stretch into being in front of our brand, not just behind our brand, from not just interviewing people, but speaking and, you know, sharing what I know. And, you know, it was really uncomfortable for me for, for many, many years. I had to work through, uh, you know, um, this sense of uh, past lives where I was killed, just say it the way it came to me. And of course, I didn't know if it was metaphoric or what it was, but I was like, oh my God, I'm so afraid to do this. Like I'm going to be killed. And it's, you know, I worked with a therapist and she said, Tammy, you're just going to be criticized. And I was like, good point. <laughs> <laughs> that probably won't kill me. Yeah. You know, I'll just be criticized. And what will I have? I will have uh, the satisfaction of self-actualization. Okay. I'm willing to risk being criticized. 
And I might be able to even help people and save them some time because I've done a lot of work and I've interviewed a lot of people and I've thought about these things a lot. So maybe I can do it in such a way that I'm both fulfilling this soul's calling, helping, serving at the same time, and the cost is being a target. Okay, I can live with that. They're well, just going to criticize me. And along with that, I suppose, comes you know the emotional healing around the fear of of exposure, exactly the fear of being attacked, the fear which we all come with to come to this world with, with the, you know, to one degree or another. But um, uh, you know, this is really kind of the crux of what this podcast is about. It's called the Selfish Gift because it really is about going public with your life's work, and and the, in, embedded in that is the idea that. Um, the contribution, your your greatest in, meant, you know, intended contribution to the world is also the thing that will bring you the most personal fulfillment and growth. Um, so, you know, you're, what you've just described is a perfect encapsulation of that. Um, I'm curious in particular about the business's growth um, because your yeah. your business is really significant. It's really um, grown into a significant um, uh, collection of businesses, really. And I am wondering um, whether there was a moment when it was at a particular inflection point and it was, did it ever feel like it was kind of getting too big for the vision that you went into it with? And did you have to stretch your own sort of sense of how, you know, how, how large and, or how significant or how, you know, whatever the, the word is, how, how big an organization you were prepared to, to, to sit at the top of? Yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, when I was young, I had a much, 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 much bigger vision. Oh my God, I love that. That's great. (laughs) And so we haven't even started to inhabit the vision that I saw as a young person and the vision that we hold at Sounds True. And so the vision that I had as a young person was when I saw CNN come online on cable news, I was like, oh, it's a news station dedicated 24 seven to what news is happening around the world. Well, what's the most important news? It's the good news of uh, this, uh, you know, and I sound like uh, a spiritual emissary and I am, but there's so much uh, spiritual wisdom that I think needs to be available on tap for people 24 seven in a very broad, non-sectarian way that helps us navigate our lives in the most practical ways. This is one of the things I'm seeing is that there's this notion that, well, spirituality, is it practical? Really? And I'm like, oh my God, it's the most practical thing there is. It's yeah, how nothing we- nothing without it. Exactly. And it's how we learn to get along with other people. And so that was really the vision. It's 24-7 spiritual wisdom being broadcast. And of course, this is way before the internet. So I thought it would be like a cable station or something. Um, Now it's obviously, you know, um, a a digital station. And we started Sounds True One just at the end of last year, which is our way to move in this direction, to have uh, an online subscription service that has live programming, community interaction, community activity. And my role at Sounds True One is to host a lot of the programming that we do. And so part of the passing of the CEO baton was that I realized I couldn't both do the kind of hosting that I want to do and manage the growth of the company and work with the leadership team and work with all the business mechanics. I couldn't really do both of these things well at the level they needed to be done. And I had a very, very, very capable person that I'd worked with for seven years who was ready to step into the CEO role. But it's huge letting go. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge letting go. Well, did it but feel I also, freeing? Was it sad? Both? What? How, how, yeah, how both. Is? Yeah. Both. Both. Deeply both. Yeah. Yeah. You'll always be the founder, though. <laughs> I can't take that away from you. And I feel so grateful. I just want to say that I had someone who I feel such a deep alignment with Mm. already having worked with this person for seven years. So it was almost like the universe set it up, but I had to agree to it. And, you know, I mentioned uh, to a teacher uh, that I uh, value that I was interviewing. um, I said, you know, uh, 
I've seen this correlation currently in my life between ego diminishment, because it felt like a kind of ego diminishment to give up that title, with soul animation and soul actualization. And he said, it, it usually goes that way, Tammy. And <laughs> I thought, that's true. Yeah, 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 beautiful. Um, I want to make sure to 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 give some time to talk about um, the inner MBA, which sure. is about to go into its. I think you said it's its fourth cycle. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, this is really all about um, uh, supporting individuals who um, who who want to walk in a similar kind of a vein to what you've just described. This sort of soul driven, um, heart led. Um, surrendered, open, uh, pur purpose, purpose oriented um, path of entrepreneurship. So it's about spiritual entrepreneurship. Um, tell us a little bit about the inner MBA and um, in particular, your seven orienting principles, just in brief. Oh my. Uh, uh, you can well, just, like, you could just list them. I listen, you know, and anyone who's listening and wants a deeper dive on the seven orienting principles, you should go and listen to Tammy's um, uh, solo episode of the uh, Insights at the Edge podcast because she does an amazing deep dive on it. But please give us the tops of the waves. Sure. Well, um, just briefly, the Inner MBA program is a nine month online learning program that Sounds Trees produced with LinkedIn as our partner and also Wisdom 2.0. Uh, a friend named Soren Gordhammer runs Wisdom 2.0. And I want to just say something for a moment, which is how much friendships and relationships have mattered to me on this whole journey and continue to matter. And Maggie, I have to say, I think of you as someone that I hope to have a deepening friendship and relationship with. You're a terrific interviewer Thank and you. host. You've really, you're really coming at this with a lot of your own uh, depth and interest. And I'm saying things that I wouldn't say in another situation as a result of that. And I'm also saying to this because one of the seven orienting principles that I offered as part of spiritual entrepreneurship is putting relationships first. And that's one of the things that I've noticed is that when I do that in my life, all kinds of terrific things happen. And it's not like a strategy, like, because that, you know, you can't like do anything like, like, hey, I, you know, then I'm like relationship selling. I'm not relationship selling. What I'm saying is when I tune in to the actual uh, heart-based connectivity that I feel when it's there, and sometimes it's not, but when it's there, if I just let myself pay attention to it and pay attention to it, not as a means to an end, but an end in and of itself. Like, oh, our relatedness with each other, our care for each other, our interest in each other, our sense of being a friend to each other, helping each other. If we just do that, it creates so many natural business opportunities. Because then at some point you write to me and you say, I have this idea for something or other, or I write to you and say, and oh my God, you want to get my email, I want to get yours. And that's happened throughout my life in so many different ways. So I'm bringing that up uh, based on uh, my partnership with Soren Gordhammer here, who helps us uh, with the inner MBA, helps with the hosting and guest invitations. And really the inspiration behind it was let's make business a the realm of growth that it is. Let's claim that. Let's start with working on ourselves to be uh, the types of managers and leaders that truly bring out the best in other people. And uh, our companies then uh, give gifts to the community and the world. Let's do that. And so these seven orienting principles, I already said, uh, put relationships first, uh, leading with presence. Yeah. Presence is this notion that every one of us can be, no matter what we do, can be an everyday teacher of presence, every one of us. And what that means is that we bring our full attention to whatever we're doing in our life and to each person we encounter. I know uh, one of the principles had to do with doing the hard things, mm -hmm. working through challenges and accepting the hard things, not being in resistance to them. But when you get that email and you go, oh, really, you know, then saying, oh, this is a great opportunity. 
this is a great opportunity, quote unquote, to practice, which means to bring everything I know, all the training that I've done on the cushion, not to just be uh, reactive, angry, and frustrated, but to pause and be with myself and find the right skillful response. This is our chance. And when we treat challenges that way, we grow, we evolve, and we help the people around us see challenges as opportunities to grow and evolve. Uh, trust the unfolding process. Uh, you mentioned, what about those times where you don't really know? And yeah, we're in these in-between times a lot. We don't really know. But can we trust it's unfolding? I'm getting more information. There'll be a new step. There'll be a new step. It's going to keep changing. Uh, let's use our businesses to solve real social problems. I think one of the reasons people have such judgment about businesses, it's like, really, that's what you're doing? You're doing what? Like, do we need that? Do we need another yada, yada, usual? And maybe it is something we need, but maybe it's not. And meanwhile, as a society, there are so many ways that we're challenged to work with energy differently, agriculture differently. We could go on and on. I believe practically every single industry and form of economics will be reinvented, every way organizations are structured, so that they honor our interdependence at the core. So start a business that solves a real social problem and design it differently. So I mean, I think that gives you uh, some of the ideas. I don't know if I enumerated all seven, but. Yeah, that that's beautiful. I'm, I'm getting full body chills as you're talking, Tammy. And I, I don't know which of those uh, principles I is my favorite because they're all my favorite. Um, uh, I, it make, what it makes me, here's what it makes me think. It makes me think that guiding you know, whether it's a voice or a sensation of being floating above the pavement or, you know, being in the right place at the right time, saying yes, all of those, those forces that led you to find your path and to continue walking on it, to build what you have built and to um, grow as a person in the way that you have, those things are available to every single one of us. I know I'm, I'm living that stuff too right now. And it's intense because it doesn't match the historic story that we have in our culture about what it means to be in business or even what it means to be a human, to kind of like live a life and set goals and make plans and, you know, live well. But how much richer as a collective would we be? How much could we move society forward and attend to our own healing and spiritual growth if we had the the courage to you know to admit what we want and to um, to to follow that that voice to trust that process? Um, it, it you know how much innovation, how much art, how much beauty, how much. Um, you know, like you said, real social problems. Um, uh, and really what it takes is just the courage to show up and lean into it. Yeah. And I think the thing I'll add, because, you know, um, I'm following my current set of instructions and some of that has me right now. I mentioned on Cortez Island, on the one hand, it's the, such a gorgeous place. And, you know, I wake up some mornings and I hear the whales breathing outside. Yeah. I mean, and it's challenging. It's challenging. You know, I didn't know there was going to be wasps outside every time I sat there with a plate of food. And the wasps are so bad and there, it's wasp season right now. I know this because I'm from BC. I'm Vancouver okay, is, so is my you know hometown. This. And especially on the islands, it's like I won't even go to Galliano in September because it's just wasp city. <laughs> Yeah. And so I'm bringing that up because I think sometimes people think, well, you know, I started following my dream and it turned out to have all of these hardships. And, you know, I think of this quote that uh, the entrepreneur in residence, uh, her name is Melissa Bernstein, who's part of the inner MBA introduced from Nietzsche that says, uh, uh, roughly quoted, uh, if you know your why, you'll endure any how. Yeah. And, you know, for me, there's a why and it's a deep kind of, it's a soul knowing. And it wasn't even, I couldn't even really tell you all of it, but there is a sense that being in a very expansive, natural place like this yeah. would bring out some quality in me that's important at this stage of my life. 
And yet there are some challenges that go with it. And, you know, the wasps are only one aspect of it. I'm just sharing that kind of a little bit more humorously. But what I'm trying to say is that it's not like, okay, well, this mentor that I work with, she said to me the other day, you know, it's kind of like, Tammy, when people tell me they want to fall in love, they want to have the love of their life. And then they do. And they have the love of their life. And it was a fantasy because now they have to do the real work of being in relationship with the love of their life. And it's not like the fantasy. And I think that's true with a lot of things in our life. And once we start seeing the hard work, we think, oh, something's wrong. This isn't right. I had this dream. It's like, no, it's just hard work. Yeah. You, That's okay. You, you shared a little story in your, in your podcast episode that I was referring to uh, around trust the process and how, you know, you, I think you were talking to some mentor and, and, and you were saying, well, what about, you know, getting stabbed in the back yeah. and people letting me down? And, and, and their response to you was, you have to trust that that getting stabbed in the back is part of the process too. And I love that so much. I recognize it. And I find that that is the most liberating insight of all because it's one thing to think oh i'm going to follow my bliss and and the end result is this somehow this pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and that's the goal um and the, all the other things just feel like obstacles in, between you and the rainbow or <laughs> between you and the pot of gold and only when you kind of flip it and say like no walking this path that has stones in it the stones are the gift for me because they are tuning me and they are purifying me and they are helping me to um shed what is not helpful in this <laughs> in this experience um and to develop what is and um and and that's kind of the the ninja move where like everything just becomes joy. Very well said, Maggie. <laughs> Tammy, uh, I have enjoyed this conversation so much. I'm going to be um, walking on cloud nine because you said that you want to be friends with me. So that's awesome. And believe me, I'm going to take you up on that. Good. Um, <laughs> for those that are uh, listening, you've got to check out the Inner MBA. It's at um, innermba.soundstrue.com. Uh, it's a place where you can learn from uh, some of the the world's you know greatest minds and, and uh, most generous hearts in the business and spirituality space. Applications close on September 21st. Um, so we're going to make sure to get this episode out there before that day. Um, Tammy, as I'm, um, as I'm letting you, just before I let you go, let me ask you one last question. Um, what is your own spiritual practice like? Is there a meditation that you do or, or, or something that you do regularly that helps to keep you um, uh, grounded and pointing in the direction of your heart? Yeah, you know, that might be the hardest uh, question. Uh, I track my body and I track when it's contracted and tight and when I'm not breathing well. And to me, breathing well, there's a silkiness to it. There's a relaxation in my body. Uh, my, My breath isn't all like choppy and I'm not like holding it in and and so, for example, I won't go into details, but I had a conversation that I could tell I was like, it's kind of like I, I ate a grenade or something and I came home and I was like, ah, and, you know, uh, my wife was like, do you want to talk about it? I'm like, I don't want to talk about it. And I was like, I just need to be with myself. And it took me like 24 hours, including a lot of exercise yesterday and a long bath. And then at the end of the bath, I was like, oh, I'm back. I'm back. I'm breathing well. I sort of worked through it. I processed through it and I needed to take that time. And so I'm constantly checking in and kind of scanning my whole inner sense of my body, seeing where there are places that are tense and tight and there often are, and then letting those places go and letting whatever kind of insights need to happen and, uh, you know, uh, acceptance and letting go occur so that I can be back fully uh, fully here and relaxed and open and available. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time today and for sharing so generously. Um, All right. Your heart. Thanks, Maggie. I really hope this conversation has inspired you to give so much of your gift to the world that it expands you into your greatest possible version of yourself. Remember, it's not selfish just because we also benefit from it. 
And here's where I get to make a selfish request. New podcasts need all the help they can get. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and subscribe to us on your favorite platform. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Selfish Gift Podcast and send me a DM. I'd love to hear how you're sharing your gift with the world. 